And with that, I would like to introduce the moderator of our opening keynote, Michelle Molnar. Michelle is the technical director of MNAI, the Municipal Natural Assets Initiative, as well as an environmental economist and a political analyst at the David Suzuki Foundation. Her work focuses primarily on the conservation of natural capital using various tools of ecological economics, policy analysis, and public outreach. So I'll pass it on to Michelle. All right, thank you, Alex, and, and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for investing your time with us today. Uh, we have an amazing panel to kick off this conference um, with the theme Pathways for Inclusive and Sustainable Recoveries. So our goal today is that whatever your role is, whether you're a student, a researcher, a practitioner, a community member, that you will come away with something, um, a new idea, a fresh perspective, a new strategy that you can apply. So here's the format for uh, the next hour and a little bit to give you an idea of what to expect. Um, I will start by briefly introducing you to each panelist and then turn the floor over individually to them to, to give a presentation. And then during the latter half of um, our time, we'll open up the floor to give you an opportunity to ask specific questions which you've been thinking about or that perhaps their presentations have sparked. So let me start with the introductions. Um, the Honorable Senator Rosa Galvez will, will kick us off. Originally from Peru, uh, Rosa Galvez is an environmental engineer, a professor, an expert in pollution, and an independent senator for Quebec. Dr. Galvez obtained a doctorate in environmental engineering from Gill University in Montreal and is a professor at Laval University in Quebec since 1994, where she chaired the Civil and Water Engineering Department from 2010 to 2016. Her fields of expertise include water and wastewater treatment processes, integrated watershed management, sustainable development, municipal and hazardous waste management, soil rehabilitation, circular economy, environmental impacts, and risk analysis. In 2016, Dr. Galvez was appointed as an independent senator for Quebec, where she chaired the Standing Senate Committee on Energy, the Environment, and Natural Resources from 2017 to 2019. Her work in the Senate focuses on environmental and climate legislation and evidence-based policy. Today, Dr. Del Galvez will be discussing her recent white paper entitled Building Forward to Bet, sorry, Building Forward Better, a Clean and Just Recovery from the COVID-19 Pandemic. She will set the tone for the overall conference around the ways the pandemic has clearly exposed systemic vulnerabilities in current economic systems and the vital importance that we must reimagine structures, systems, and organizations in order to build a brighter future for all. Then we will hear from Chris Tollefson. Chris is the founding principal of Tollefson Law, a professor of law at the University of Victoria, and the founding executive director of the Pacific Center for Environmental Law and Litigation, Canada's first charity dedicated to educating and training aspiring environmental litigators. He has degrees from Queen's, the University of Victoria, and Osgoode Hall Law School, and clerked at the BC Court of Appeal for Justices Lambert and MacDonald. Chris's counsel work has included appearances before all levels of courts, including the Supreme Court of Canada and various environmental regulatory boards and tribunals. He was counsel to BC Nature and Nature Canada during both the Enbridge Northern Gateway and Kinder Morgan Trans Mountain Pipeline hearing processes. His publications cover a range of environmental and natural resource topics, including environmental assessment, ecosystem, or sorry, eco certification, and access to justice. He is also a co author of leading environmental law textbooks. Chris is a former president of EcoJustice and founding executive director of the University of Victoria's Environmental Law Center. In 2014, Chris was the recipient of Nature Canada's Conservation Partner Award for his work leading their legal team during the Northern Gateline Pipeline hearings. And with that, 
I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Galvez. Thank you so much. Looking forward to having uh, this conversation with, with, with you. I thank Kangxi for this kind invitation and um, I'm going to share my, uh, my screen. So I, um, I'm, I'm going to speak and I'm going to make a reflection aloud. I'm not an economist, I'm an engineer and um, I have moved from um, um, research and academics to politics. Um, so uh, I want to share my thoughts. So of course, we all know that we are in a very difficult, dangerous situation with respect to the environment. And that, that this situation in which we are, uh, we have a major role, humans, that we play in, in what is happening. And um, this is a multi-factor problem. Um, we, we are a lot of people in this uh, planet. Uh, we have um, um, customs on overconsumption and there is technology and some people think that technology can arrange many of the things uh, going on. Yes, it can, but many of them also we can't because we are confronted to a planet that has processes and laws that humans cannot simply bend. So I believe that um, the way that we need to approach um, this problem is by a change in paradigm. We have to move from uh, individual thinking analysis in silo, a, a linear analysis that we've been doing, especially uh, in, with respect to the economy and the models, the linear economy that we, we follow, and start trying to understand how the networks work, what are the factors, what are the interactions, and to adopt new values of life in society. So I'm going to try to explore some of these issues. Uh, so I really thought that the economy was there to show us a path and it was a tool for attaining a society um, global objectives. But unfortunately, I changing my mind because I saw that we have become little by little a society where it is important that we solve the products that we produce. And um, we have um, extracted increasingly from um, natural resources, and we have also increased our ecological footprint, and we are using more and more of these limited natural resources per capita within the time and combined with the growing population. So we have uh, really need to try to think how are we going to nourish the always increasing population and maintain this quality of life that pushes us for consumption. And um, what we finally have to conclude uh, is that around the world, that is in many areas deprivation for essential um, services like water, food. Uh, we have environmental degradation. And with all of that, we have a very in, um, daring uh, inequality. So we, one of the things that we have to do is to change this model from take, make, use, and dispose to a one that can sustain our, um, our development. I know that the economies use the word externalities, but I think it's a simplistic way. It is more uh, profound, the, the changes that we need to do in the system in order for it to work. I follow the World Economic Forum for the last, um, I would say 10 years, because it offered me this possibility of analyzing these domino effects of multi-factors. And I just want to mention this one. You know, a simple thing like a tax uh, avoidance, tax evasion, cause loss on revenue for governments, cause chronic budget imbalances, these inequalities, distrust in democracy, and the failure of governance. 
and instability in the economic sector, such as the natural resources, the energy, the infrastructure, which of course, as an engineer, just I was talking to the Canadian Association and American Association of Civil Engineers, and I was talking about how climate change is posing risk to energy, to infrastructure. So we have difficulties in adapting to this planet warming. Greenhouse emissions are increasing. And so we are in this spiral of destructive uh, extreme weather events. So now today, environmental concerns dominate in terms of consequence and probabilities. And um, uh, they are the major worries for the next 10 years. What is the solution? Well, maybe we can reverse this domino effect and we can address the real sources of problems. So I'm sure you know about the planetary boundaries economic model proposed in 2009 by a group of scientists where they are saying that uh, there are nine processes uh, and these are the limits of the planet um, that uh, make the planet benevolent and, um, um, and good for um, life of human as we know it. Unfortunately, with um, that imbalance that our socioeconomic model have caused, we are exceeding these limits. And we have problems with respect to climate change, but also with respect to loss of biodiversity and species extinction, which is very, very dangerous and worrying. Uh, so uh, Madame um, Mrs. Roward in 2012 came out with an idea that there is a donut, a, a donut section in uh, um, that can be the place where humanity find the safe and the just space to live in harmony with, um, with nature. And uh, putting a lot of emphasis on, the, um, on values and, and, and on equity and um, um, a, a basic standard uh, quality life uh, based on water, food, health, access to education, a decent work, um, peace and justice, uh, a governance uh, within democracy that will work. So these are things that I am um, reflecting and reading a lot so that I can bring these um, notions and this principles and these um, approaches, new approaches to the political level. If we will take a picture today of uh, who's uh, putting more gas emissions in the atmosphere, we will see that China, US, India are the ones that today they are putting more um, um, greenhouse gas in the atmosphere that has reached the 400 milligrams per liter of CO2 equivalent uh, that has never been there um, in the memory of, of humans. But when we see the whole planet and we know that uh, um, there are big emitters and that we, we can identify them, we also can see places such in the Caribbean or in the Indian Ocean or Indonesia where there was no um, big input of greenhouse emissions, but they are, um, um, supporting and enduring all the impacts brought by um, extreme weather events. And so what is important is when we want to assign responsibilities and we want to assign contributions to the climate change fight, fight and the um, greenhouse uh, reduction is that we have to see that historically um, the G20 countries were the ones that were putting more um, uh, gas emissions into the atmosphere. And this is very important because we have to attain uh, uh, an understanding of uh, what is our fair share in the efforts for um, reducing these emissions. And it's interesting because um, greenhouse emissions goes pair uh, side by side with GDP per capita. And, and of course, um, we are trying to decouple decouple the emissions from the uh, GDP grow. Uh, but uh, one thing that I am learning is that GDP is used um, ubiquitously for all kinds of uh, measurements. But I really wonder if it's the, 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 the good indicator for many of the things that we need to measure. Because as an engineer, we always say, if I want to solve a problem, I must 
I must measure it first. And GDP is not measuring uh, the extent of the problem. So climate change is uh, bringing risks to health. And as an engineer, protection of health, health and, and, uh, and safety of the public is paramount uh, for me. And so I've been following what are these risks. And it's very interesting to see that zoonotic virus spilling to humans was there since many, many years ago. And uh, another thing that is important to know is that very seldom, very, very seldom times, we focus on prevention. And we don't say that prevention can save us a lot of trouble and it can save a lot of costs. So by reducing greenhouse emissions, we will save money with respect to our health cost. The other part of the climate risk is the, the destruction of important basic infrastructure. And it is sad to say, but in 2020, Alberta province was hit with all kinds of extreme weather events from wildfires to um, hail storms to, to flooding, all happening in the same year. And I'm sure that eventually we will learn by scientists are looking at this, that there is a regional effect of putting greenhouse gases uh, because when we look at uh, the plan and at the car, at the map, and we see uh, these weather events, it's like it, it, we cannot miss that uh, they are happening here. Um, now, the other point on this graph is that this cost, very, very uh, high, high cost going from one to 43 billion per year by 2050. Well, let me tell you that I know that the government doesn't have a, a pocket or a or a piggyback where it's going to take money every time there is an extreme weather event. And so it is really, really important that, that we move to action and we start uh, on one side reducing uh, the emissions and on the other side adapting to the climate change. So unfortunately, Canada has consistently failed or its emission targets. We sign, we are signatories of Rio de Janeiro, Kyoto, Copenhagen, and the Paris Agreement, but we have failed them, all of them. And if we include the total emissions downstream, downstreams, we will see that uh, it is twice what we report. So it's really, we are not doing uh, our, uh, the efforts that we must. Yet, yet, as an engineer, I can tell you that clean technology exists, that the Cost for solar and wind infrastructures are reducing exponentially that between 70 and 80% of Canadians want a, a transition to clean energy and want a clean recovery from pandemics. And that, that these, uh, these innovations in, in these clean uh, technologies will create jobs. So what is missing? It's actually uh, something that I'm really very interested to know. And that's what I put also the other factor, the social factors, because technology is there. If we have funds for something, we should have funds for this. We give money to oil and companies and subsidies. So what is the reason? I am the sponsor of uh, Bill C-12, the Canadian Net Zero Emissions Accountability Act in the Senate. And I'm very much looking forward to uh, this uh, legislation arriving to the Senate so we can pass it as, as quickly as possible. It is a statement. It is an expert head towards where we need to go. And this time we need to have not only the targets, but the actions to attain those targets. So we in, in Canada, there are already six, six provinces that have this legislation. And in the, in, the, in the world, there are countries already before us that have this legislation with very good leaders, like, for example, the UK. During the pandemic, um, I was so worried about what was happening. And I knew that COVID didn't broke the system. I, I knew that COVID exposed what was already going not so good in our system. And so I wanted to do uh, awareness, raise awareness, and I wanted to everybody to try to read and be informed because policies needs to be based in facts and evidence. So we wrote this paper, um, Building Forward Better, a Clean and Just Recovery from the COVID-19 Pandemic. And uh, we, we 
talked about COVID, we talked about what other uh, countries are doing. And as I mentioned, you know, we knew about um, um, zoonosis um, in um, viruses spilling over uh, humans because, because we are in this um, vicious circle of pollution, damage to ecosystem, climate change, and pandemics. And, and the coronavirus that have arisen and spilled to, to humans have come from cattle, like the swine uh, uh, fever or like the um, variant flu and now the um, end, but also from encroaching into the uh, habitats of wildlife like this coronavirus, COVID-19 is. So when we are in a crisis, the government will go into three stages, you know, keep our economy afloat, providing relief to essential economic sectors and workers and provide economic stimulus. And we are at that point to restart the economy sustainable. And this is what uh, Budget 21 is trying to do. We, the government, I think that it was, has been very serious in doing the first two stages properly and that the money and the funds that has been injected has been for sustaining essential services and, and workers. And uh, you can find all the details of what I'm talking in the white paper. We are now at the third level in trying to put an stimulus. However, you know, we have lived crisis before and we cannot make the same mistakes. We cannot not put conditionality to sectors uh, that receive this assistance because this is public money, this is taxpayers' money. And we have many crises at hand, as, as I mentioned. So we cannot just um, solve one crisis, which is the economic, which is like the inflation or the um, recession, we need to, with our, our funds, we need to be more effective and more efficient and, um, and, uh, and solve many crises at the same time. So in this white paper, we propose clean energy infrastructure investment, building effi efficiency, natural capital investment, clean research and development. And um, in order to attain some goals like a low carbon economy or uh, resilient infrastructures and protecting ecosystem, because we need uh, ecosystem in health if humans win we want to be in health. And I know economic, um, economists are very interested in how do we pay. And of course, Canadians are very worried about the debt. However, I know that uh, we gave a lot of, of uh, funds to the oil and gas as subsidies. And, and, and the range are between uh, 1 billion to 10 billion per year. And the reason because we don't know is because it is so gray, this area, that nobody seems to know exactly how much we give them. Then, you know, we talk about new taxes like um, like the, the one that government did by taxing luxury items, but we want more um, coherent things in order to reduce inequalities, to have a wealth and corporate tax, and of course, um, close the tap loopholes and in and, 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 uh, and paradises, fiscal paradises, because like, for example, after the Panama Papers scandal, we know 300 names of Canadians that were there, and there has been no one single prosecution of this situation. So we know that there are means to um, pay in for the recovery that does not necessarily means taxing again and more the workers or the middle class. Um, budget 21, so it has a section for a healthy environment in a healthy economy that includes growing our net zero economy, investing in our clean energy future, advancing Canada climate plan, etc., which is around 7% of our GDP. But when we compare it with uh, Europe, it's very small. We, when we compare it with the United States, it's very small. One of the aspects that I, I think is the reason for that is because the lobbying of certain sectors are so strong, so strong in Canada that despite of a clear uh, political speech in the actions, there are still some lagging. So we have to move into uh, stop talking about transition and start talking about transformation because we don't have any more the 30, 40 years that we had in the 70s when first we knew about this climate change. We don't have the luxury of that. And so we need to 
transform into a low carbon economy in, a, in an inclusive, fair, just um, way. So I hope I didn't exceed my time. Thank you so much. And I'm looking forward to further this discussion. Thank you so much, Senator Galvez. Um, I think we're just fine with time. We, we started a little early, so, so we should be okay. Um, and with that, Chris, I'm just gonna pull up your, your presentation and I will then turn it over to you. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you um, to the CANSI organizers for inviting me. Uh, thank you to Elder Dick for that welcome. Uh, and thank you so much, uh, Senator Galvez, for, I think, so effectively uh, offering us a view of um, the big picture and for all of the work that you do on behalf of the public interest around this climate uh, issue in Ottawa. Um, I'm going to th thank you as well to Michelle, who will be advancing my slides and for that introduction. Um, my topic, as it says uh, on the slide, my topic is focusing on youth led climate litigation and how that um, uh, relates to the question that, that I, th I think is is close to the center of of, of the theme of, of of this conference which is recovering a stable climate system how those two things relate and I think both of them are are very much in motion and um, indeed uh, even today uh, there is a case that came down in Australia direct directly on point so um, with that, we'll, we'll move into the presentation. Next slide, please, Michelle. Um, this photo depicts um, Vancouver, Vancouver Art Gallery on October 25th, 2019, uh, which was the day that um, on behalf of 15 young Canadians, we filed Canada's first national youth-led climate challenge, uh, challenging Canada's response to the climate emergency that, um, that, we, continue, that we continue to face. Um, and um, that case is called La Rose versus Her Majesty the Queen, HMTQ. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the plaintiffs and their case uh, uh, shortly, but let me maybe tackle the question, at least frame the question about what it would take, where we are at, and what it would take to recover a stable climate system first. I think, as Senator Galvis has noted and is well known, we are already facing serious and irreversible harms associated with climate change. Uh, the current baseline in terms of global average temperature increase since pre-industrial times, the current baseline is actually quite shocking. Uh, the, the, the average is between 1.1 and 1.2 degrees, which is perilously close to the 1.5 degree standard, the aspirational standard set out in Paris, um, and indeed is creeping upward towards the much more conservative 2.0 standard. Um, that was the hard cap um, agreed upon in Paris. The science, as I said, is a moving target the Paris Agreement is based upon science that was done a decade ago, but in more recent years, I think science is telling us that we need to be even more worried. Uh, that 2.0 is not safe. That 1.5 likely isn't safe. Why? Well, that's a global average. 
in some places around the world were already exceeding that average, including in the Netherlands, uh, where the average is now 1.7 and where yesterday in the Hague District Court, a landmark decision came down uh, that we could talk about uh, if, if we want to, involving uh, a challenge to the policies of Royal, Royal Dutch Shell. So science marches on, and, 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 and I, I think what's really interesting is that there does seem now to be a consensus that we need to get to net zero, that we need to get to net zero by 2050. But at the same time, I think if you dig a little deeper, scientists are telling us that even that may not be enough depending upon when it is that we get to net zero and how we get to net zero and what net zero actually means, we could still be facing catastrophic harms. Indeed, I think the science is telling us that net zero may not be enough in the long term, that we need to be developing a strategy that contemplates and implements negative emissions, extracts CO2 from the atmosphere. In the end, that may be our only course, our only safe course of action, and yet that scarcely, in my view, is on, is on the radar. We still, cons we still largely are focused on Paris and to a large degree on the two degree target it sets. I'm not a climate scientist, and, and, and I know there are those who, who, who on, this, on this webinar, much more better informed, but I want to I put that out there uh, as a context, as, as, a, as a point of departure for the discussion. The other thing I want to put out there um, is the impacts that this crisis, this emergency we're facing are already having and will continue to have on children and youth. Children and youth suffer multiple and intersecting and synergistic forms of disadvantage as a result of climate change. Physical harms, mental, economic, political, legal, etc. They are in, in many ways um, the perfect plaintiffs for bringing these kinds of cases forward because of the impacts, the generational impacts that they now in the future uh, will be suffering. Final point I guess I want to put out there is this, that we have moved a great distance in the debate and the public discourse around climate change. Uh, certainly in this country and around the world I think more generally we have largely accepted and internalized that this is an emergency, that it must be dealt with. But I, but I think that we still are in a form of denial. And there's a lot of deniers out there. The denial has to go, uh, relates largely to the pace uh, with which we must address, respond to this crisis. The new form of denial really is about how quickly we must move. And that is a good intro, I think, into youth climate litigation. Next slide. This is a picture uh, depicting uh, the day before we filed our suit, depicting 13 of our 15 plaintiffs, young people from across Canada, um, all of whom have personally been active in their communities and beyond um, advocating for more effective response to climate change. Each of them as well have suffered individual harms, physical, mental, and other harms that we document uh, in the claim that we, have, that we have filed. We say as a result of those individualized harms, they have private standing, personal standing as individuals notwithstanding that they're not even really allowed to sue in their own name, uh, most of them because they're minors, they have to sue 
uh, with the permission of their guardian. The other thing about the case that I, I, I think is important apart from it being one of the first cases to argue that the harms are already happening. One of the other things about the case that is important is that these young people have sought to be given standing permission from the court to represent all young Canadians and future generations of Canadians uh, on the footing that they can credibly represent those interests in court. The issue of whether they should be granted that standing has has yet to be determined, but but I, I think they really have a strong argument that that is something that they should be entitled to do. Next slide, please. The LaRose claim, which is hyperlinked there, the LaRose claim is one that seeks to address legally the big picture of what's going on here. We say that it isn't one action or omission on the part of the federal government that makes it responsible, hold, creates uh, legal liability uh, for uh, breach of charter rights or other rights that these plaintiffs have. We say that it is a cluster of acts and omissions. It is a network of activity, both positive acts, which include subsidization of the fossil fuel industry, as well as omissions to act, failure to meet various targets, to, to, to drag its heels in the face of an emergency. So in our lawsuit, rather than focusing on one particular wrongful act or omission, we try to argue that a court must look at the whole picture. And the whole picture, we say, is one that leads inexorably to the conclusion that for these plaintiffs and for young people in their position, government has failed. They have failed in a way that breaches these young people's rights under both Section 7 and 15 of the Charter, their rights to life, liberty, and security of the person, as well as their rights to equal protection under the law. And, and we say not to be generationally disadvantaged. We also, in our lawsuit, argue that uh, the government, quite apart from the Charter, is under a common law duty to protect certain resources that are common to all and, and upon which human life and liberties depend, uh, including the territorial sea, the atmosphere, and the permafrost. All public resources, we say, within federal jurisdiction and all resources which we say the federal government is failing to protect and as a consequence uh, is causing harm to the public and to these plaintiffs. As with most youth cases um, like this, we're not seeking money damages. What we are seeking really is action. We're seeking the court to declare that uh, uh, the rights we say have been infringed have in fact been infringed. We want to spotlight uh, that decision and we want the court to order government to develop and implement a credible climate recovery plan based upon, based upon ba best available science, which is consistent with Canada's fair share of the uh, of the work that needs to be done to address this emergency and we want the court to retain jurisdiction supervision over this case until um, until that plan has been fully has been fully developed and implemented next slide please our case is part of quite a quite an amazing array of litigation around the world that in recent years has been brought by young people and 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 which um, in 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 recent months and certainly even in recent days is showing quite remarkable results 
Uh, and I want to talk about each of those cases uh, in, in turn, starting with Juliana. Next slide, please. Juliana is one of the very first cases of its kind, and it is styled, it is framed in a very similar way to La Rose, um, although filed some years before. In this case, these young people depicted here have sued the federal government uh, on, the, on a theory similar to La Rose, which is that through a network of acts and omissions, the federal government has breached their rights under the U.S. Constitution and under the public trust uh, reposed in it um, by virtue of the federal of the federal common law. Uh, this case, I think, is an inspiration and has become a model for for many other cases that have since followed. It emphasizes, I think, among other things, the importance of asserting that we all have a right to a stable climate system, that that is foundational to the exercise of all the other rights that we enjoy. It is, in other words, perhaps the very first job, the most essential job of the state to, pr to preserve the conditions within which human life can continue. And to do that, to, to measure whether that, that right is being properly protected. We need to be vigilant and to constantly be informed by the best available science. Not to tether our claims to targets that have been politically brokered through agreements like Paris, but rather to ensure that we protect those rights by um, making sure that that determination is informable of what science is telling us right now. Um, the Juliana case is in, a, is in abeyance at this point uh, uh, as a result of uh, some machinations at the appellate level. Uh, it has, I think, really set some important precedents, but to hit a roadblock in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal on a very narrow technical issue, which is whether the remedy that they were seeking for these breaches uh, whether the remedy was one that a federal court could order. Um, so, so while Juliana carries on in its own right, it really is, I think, in many ways um, uh, of even greater importance, um, um, the, uh, the, the catalytic effect that it has had in terms, of, in terms of other cases. Next slide, please. And that catalytic effect... Uh, I, th I think uh, is reflected uh, certainly uh, in the agenda decision and in other decisions um, that we'll be talking about. Urgenda, of course, is, is in some ways a companion to Juliana, the first start uh, filed around the same time, but with different results in Urgenda, these young people uh, are, are there celebrating uh, an incredible victory that, to large extent, turns on the court holding that the European Convention on Human Rights is indeed a, a binding and action-forcing piece of legislation, that it actually creates domestic responsibilities. And here the court uh, basically orders the Netherlands government to do more uh, based upon a fair share analysis of what the Netherlands um, should be doing relative to the relative to the global picture, as well as uh, being mindful that the evolving science around this issue must be must be uh, constantly borne in mind. The other thing about agenda, I think, is important is that here we see the courts very. Um, clearly affirm that they do have jurisdiction, that this is a matter that is justiciable. In other words, a matter over which this court has jurisdiction, because ultimately, according to the court, because ultimately it is a human rights issue. Um, and uh, that is always a matter over which courts have jurisdiction. Next slide, please.
On the heels of that decision, we see a bunch of other decisions, I think all of which, um, uh, for the most part, give us cause for optimism about the future. For instance, in Ireland, where the government had indeed passed a law, a specific law, propo proposing to implement um, its uh, international obligations to combat climate change. In this case, which came down last year, in this case, the highest court in Ireland uh, held that the law um, that the law did not adequately elaborate, explain how um, that um, obligation was going to be discharged, how that trajectory towards the government's target would be implemented. In that case as well, the court uh, uh, did not rule out the possibility that the Irish Constitution, which in a lot of ways is similar to our Charter of Rights and Freedoms, that that did uh, include um, a standalone right to a stable climate system. Next slide, please. Now this year, of course, we see an acceleration of, of, of decisions coming down. Notre Faire is uh, uh, one that to many of you may have seen reference to that came down in France. Here, it's a different scenario. The, there was no specific law being challenged, uh, which is usually an easier matter to challenge a specific law. Here, the challenge was brought to the failure of, of, the, of, of the French government, its omission to meet its obligations uh, under Paris and under EU law. And again, we see strong and I think sophisticated uh, judicial analysis of why this case must succeed uh, using a fair share analysis and deploying the idea of carbon budgets, um, which are budgets that um, uh, help to quantify uh, how much carbon, if any, uh, both globally and nationally, can be emitted uh, without compromising a trajectory that would take us towards the goal of a stable climate system. Next slide, please. The final case that I, I want to uh, uh, talk about is Neubauer the, uh, that came down um, quite recently. Uh, there is another case, or two cases actually, since this one. But Neubauer, um, I think, uh, uh, deserves special comment in terms of the arc of youth litigation, um, because here uh, it, uh, the challenge really, I think, resembles in a lot of ways, uh, resembles in a lot of ways uh, the LaRose challenge. It is a challenge brought under the German constitution, similar to the Irish case, uh, alleging that the German government had failed um, uh, through its climate law uh, to meet its obligations to protect human life and liberties. Um, here again, we see reference to the fair share theory, to 1.5 as being a potentially safe metric. Um, and, and I guess perhaps most notably, we see reference made to, and I think this is very important, Reference made to the idea that there are, under this basic law, there are uh, something that we can think of in terms of as being intergenerational rights, rights that, uh, that uh, are intertemporal, that exist in the, in, in the here and now, but also uh, are capable of being asserted into the, into the future. Um, both by these plaintiffs and 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 by Germans um, who have yet to be born. Um, Chris, sorry, would you mind just qu um, wrapping up your presentation shortly so that we can move on to the questions because it's been 15 minutes. Thank you so much. So to wrap up, <laughs> I want to just leave you with three with three uh, slides here, uh, uh, and maybe we just go to the go to them now. Uh, we'll go to the one after that, actually. Uh, what is the significance of youth-led climate litigation? Well, I, I, 
I think that and these are all things we can talk about. I think that, uh, next slide please. One is that I think youth-led climate litigation um, is, I think, a powerful response to democratic failure um, and uh, can contribute to the, to the assertion of democratic rights within our, within our legal and political tradition. Secondly, next slide, please. I think it's an important uh, phenomenon in terms of getting the courts involved in uh, dealing with this emergency. It's, meant, it's often said that courts are not a suitable venue to deal with science or to challenge important uh, democratic uh, or, or to deal with important polycentric democratic questions. I think that the record of the courts and the nature of government's failure to deal with these issues suggest that the, this is one of those situations where courts must um, must step up and are stepping up. And finally, next slide. Finally, and I think this is important for all of uh, all of us who are uh, concerned uh, about scholarship, about evidence-based decision making. I think that youth-led climate litigation provides the opportunity for us to ensure that politicians and other decision makers are held to account based upon the best available science. Not science that was uh, current 10 years ago, but science that is uh, in peer review right now. And I think that science is telling us that the emergency is even more dire than we thought and, and, that, uh, and that we need to take more urgent action. And uh, with that, I will open the floor to questions. Thank you both um, for sharing your knowledge and your experiences with us today. Um, uh, very much appreciated. And although we're not together in person, um, it seems awkward to, to clap over, <laughs> over Zoom. So um, maybe I'll, I'll just uh, kick off the questions here. Um, I'd be interested, you know, as we're thinking about, um, you know, how, how we uh, respond to and address uh, recovery um, at this time, I'd be interested in hearing from the both of you, what some common misperceptions people have um, are and, and how we combat these misconceptions and communicate more effectively. Um, so maybe I'll, I'll ask uh, you, Senator Galvez, to, to start us off. And then uh, Chris, it would be great to hear your, your thoughts as well. Um, thank you very much, Chris, for your incredible presentation. I learned a lot. And uh, you, um, um, there, I, I will say about two misconceptions. And as an engineer, I thought that environmental legislation was there to protect the environment. And um, with my practice, I realized that it was not there for that. It was to, to delay it. It was to dilute it. And, and it was to um, allow the, uh, the pollution because everything is in terms of a concentration, it's not in terms of accumulation or it's not in terms of effects that we are finding. So that's a misconception. And I'm really, really trying very strong in the Senate to tell people that we have to change that mentality. We have to prevent before it happens. The second misconception, because we are talking with economists, is this use of GDP as a master parameter that can measure everything when it doesn't. It doesn't measure the destruction of the environment. It doesn't uh, um, actually, actually, whatever economic activity, whether it is positive or negative, it will be count in the GDP. And uh, and the economists know that. And and persons like, for example, the president of the Canadian bank, the governor of the bank, he he knows. He he even said to me, uh, you know that. A Canadian population are growing older and uh, people taking their retirement are, are living longer and that uh, this is costing a lot of money, but GDP doesn't take in consideration that. So we all know that, but we are not proposing 
other ways of measuring. And again, if we don't measure something, how can we solve a problem that we cannot measure? Thank you. Um, well, I guess I've, I alluded to this in my presentation and I guess I'm, uh, I'm happy to elaborate a little bit. I, I think it's a huge misconception that um, if we get eventually to zero, to net zero emissions, that that will solve the problem. I, I think that what, and, and this goes to the point about the need for best available science to be brought in to political discourse and, and to be part of an accountability system. We have to understand that the CO2 and CO2 equivalent gases that we've released um, since the industrial revolution, the, those are in the atmosphere for hundreds, potentially a thousand years or more. Um, and we're locked into that. So it, it, I think the beauty of the carbon budget um, analysis, which talks about um, how much more carbon, if any, we can release, we can release safely. Uh, what that I think suggests is that um, we need to continue to study uh, what a safe and stable climate system looks like. And that is not the same thing as uh, net zero. Uh, it may even be something that uh, we can't quantify in terms of an average temperature increase in terms of 1.5 or 2 because of the differential impact of climate change around the world. So I think we need a more nuanced and robust body of science informed by concepts that can be applied and understood like fair share and carbon budgets. We can't take for granted that Paris is the roadmap and we have to beware of those that are talking about net zero. Thank you. The next question I have is, is for you, Chris. Uh, climate change action is often seen as political. Do you foresee or has there been any backlash over the perception of the courts interfering with government policies? Well, that that is, I think, an important dynamic that plays out in every youth-led, in fact, in, in all climate cases, but especially in youth-led ones, which are seeking to address harms now and into the future. Um, I think the traditional instinct of courts is to be nervous about weighing in to complex scientific areas or to be making determinations that could be perceived as second guessing uh, po uh, political decisions that we need to make. Um, so in every case, I think it's important to, to, to recognize that there is um, a division of labor between the courts, the executive and the legislative branches. And, and in LaRose, we, we basically say that when it comes to legal questions, such as whether uh, an individual's charter rights have been breached, that clearly is in the legal, the judicial bailiwick. Um, we wouldn't uh, suggest that the court should decide what the target should be necessarily or how to meet a target, but they can certainly decide the question of whether legal rights have been breached. And they can certainly, we say, supervise uh, governmental efforts informed by best available science as how to fix that problem. Um, but yeah, that's absolutely a key, that's a key, a key concern in all these cases. Thank you. The next question is for you, Dr. Galvez. Um, how do you make short-term, often four-year governments care about multi-generational or transnational issues? That's an interesting question. So um, I start getting worried about um, politics because of the short term of elected politicians and seeing that uh, climate change uh, is something that affects so many in the scale time and it affects um, 
you know, at different scales, months, but also seasonal, uh, but also, you know, over generations. So I realized that I, if I turn into politics, I couldn't be in the House of Commons. The only way was to be in the Senate, because in the Senate, we try to see these issues at long term and study these uh, with a long term perspective and, and also taking in consideration the difference of impact from the regions and also for the minorities, you know, like, for example, take COVID, it has impacted so much some minorities and um, and, and so it is a difficult problem, but as um, Chris was talking, we have the different powers. So uh, the, the MPs are there for something and the senators must be for something else. And then the judicial, uh, judicial should be there for, for other things too. So if everybody plays its role, then we have a holistic, um, a holistic management on governance uh, of our society, which I think that we have been failing because of the reason that I explained, uh, we are uh, losing trust in democratic institutions because of all these things that we say we are going to do and finally we don't do. So we have to expect the courts to come and, and rule instead of us. And, uh, but hopefully, yes, if everybody assumes its role and actually the Senate too, and I'm pushing my colleagues, we are independent. We're supposed to be there for these type of things. Think long-term, hopefully we will get there. Thank you. And I, I think this is um, ultimately for both of you, I'll, I'll start with, with you, Chris. Um, so the question says, thank you for sharing an overview of so many of these cases. I'm interested in how successful cases have shaped policy practices. Are there concrete examples where a successful case has led to a clear policy outcome with accountability mechanisms? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, and uh... It doesn't happen all the time. You know, sometimes governments, even when they lose in these cases, these cases, and maybe sometimes especially when they lose, will continue to dig their heels in and resist. Um, but sometimes uh, an adverse decision against the government can be empowering. It can, it can give them political license to go further than they would have gone without that decision. And I think that's exactly what's happened in Germany in, in the last week, actually, where in the face of the Neubauer decision, instead of appealing, um, and of course, there's a political mix there that involves the Green Party that's helping to, I think, uh, uh, destabilize and, and push for change. Uh, the government has actually uh, taken the decision um, as a mandate to um, do better, to make more stringent targets and to implement them more quickly. So um, it's not a sure thing, um, but uh, it can happen. And, uh, and I, I honestly think in the last week or two, with the decision uh, that we see uh, in the Netherlands against uh, Royal Dutch Shell and then today in um, Australia and their Federal Court of Appeal, the Sharma case, um, the tide is turning and courts everywhere will be paying attention to that as legislatures as well. Can I add um, something Absolutely. about Absolutely. Yes, so I, um, I'm so happy that the courts are there and I'm happy that the, the system we have in Canada because we have, we have seen uh, last year in the United States how you know uh, judges are are appointed following a partisan um, 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 model that could really really uh, cause prejudice in the uh, in the analysis of the cases. Um, I think that we have a, an interesting model in UK. UK has a, an independent science um, compo scientists compose council that stays there despite of who is in the executive who, who what is the government that is in power what is the party that is in power and uh, 
um, in in Canada, we are we are saying the speech says we want that we want that, except that in the actions we are still not there. For example, in this um, C12, there is a um, um, advisory panel, and uh, it was not mentioned whether it was going to be an, a stakeholder panel or if it was going to be a scientist panel. But when the the people were nominated, it was clear that it was not a scientific panel. Uh, we follow what UK does, and we are trying to influence and, and say this needs to be reviewed. Hopefully, there will be some amendments in that direction because, uh, because we need this science base to def define targets and uh, to also to recommend technologies because there are there is not just that the technology is going to be efficient, but we have also the, the scale of time because we are in a in we need to do transformation in a quick time. So we don't have the time 15 years to develop some technologies that seems to be promising, but only at the long term. Um, so, um, yes. Thank you. So I think you both touched upon this, but but perhaps the uh, the question is is asking for um, a little bit more information. So it reads, while the focus here is on climate change, there is an equally fundamental challenge of the loss of biodiversity. What are your views on the proposed crime of ecocide and the need for a UN declaration on the right to a healthy environment? Well, maybe I can start. So um, we have uh, an MP in the other in the other house uh, that proposed a bill for um, recognizing that we all have the right to a healthy environment. Uh, it's a human right, and um, um, I think that it is a movement that it's pushing all over the world. And I think eventually it will be. Uh, I think the government also has included into um, other legislations. Uh, but it doesn't stand alone. So I'm not a lawyer. I cannot know which is better, uh, but I think it's there. And um, yes, absolutely, we, we, we need that because uh, we depend on the uh, on the ecosystem. We, we depend on these ecological services that uh, um, planet Earth give to us. So if something happened to them, we, we, we are also very, in very bad situation. So we have to protect uh, both. Um, I, uh, I agree. I think that um, in, through international law, uh, important change can happen. We, we shouldn't be under illusions that if a law is passed internationally through a convention or a treaty that things will immediately uh, change domestically, but change does happen. And there's a symbolic and and, and leverage value to securing those victories on the international stage. They empower domestic um, uh, courts who are inclined to be proactive to do the right to do the right thing. Um, I think uh, the Convention on Biodiversity passed in in Rio has had a huge effect, but we need to, I think, uh, redouble our efforts. It makes sense for us to come back to that issue internationally and do more work. I think we uh, recognized in that convention the precautionary principle, and that was important. But I think rights-based um, documents, uh, because of the nature of a legal system, tend to get more traction. Um, and um, just as I think the International Criminal Court has made great strides in terms of the human rights um, in, in terms of human rights globally, I think um, the recognition of, 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 of similar rights and, and the creation of a similar kind of venue would be a huge step forward. Great. So this question might be a little technical, so, so feel free to, to let me know. Um, it reads, as ecological economists, we critique the use of discount rates, including the social discount rate in Canada at 3%. So really recognizing that a dollar today is often considered more valuable than a dollar tomorrow. This amounts to the discounting of intergenerational rights. Is this something 
that can be used legally to argue for structural discrimination against use in public policy decision making. So it'd be great to hear uh, both of your views there. Um, maybe I'll start with you, Senator. Mm, that, that, that's a difficult question for me, but absolutely, by all means that we take care of next generation, it's, it's very important. Um, I was posting in Facebook that I was, when uh, Chris was showing these lawsuits by young people, I was having um, contradictory feelings. On one hand, I was feeling so proud because I have my children and my grandchildren that I depend on each one of these wins. And at the same time, I was feeling so ashamed of my generation that uh, needs to be pushed like this to, to act and to do something. So yes, future generations need to have the same opportunities uh, and the same quality of life that we enjoy it. And by all means that we will be able to do that, to ensure that I will be supporting that. Yeah, the question is right on point, really. And I think is an argument that should be made and I expect will be made in ongoing cases where uh, the issue of intergenerational rights has been raised. I, I think implicitly our political system does this in any event, even though economists, leaving aside what economists do, our political system does discount voices who can't vote, voices who are young and, and who won't be impacted right away. It does that. Uh, uh, and yet in a lawsuit, I think you have to show real evidence of that and the discount rate, which is something that is broadly applied and recognized, the discount rate um, is compelling evidence of that. It's a smoking gun, really, of how we treat future generations. Right, I couldn't agree more. This question is also for the both of you. What are your thoughts on the Supreme Court ruling on federal carbon pricing law? And will it lead to some proactive efforts in reducing emissions drastically? And uh, Chris, maybe we'll, we'll start with you. Well, the decision is not um, unexpected. I, th I think that uh, most informed people would have expected that our federal government would have that jurisdiction. What's a little surprising is how narrowly the Supreme Court of Canada defined the ambit of that jurisdiction. Um, that's kind of the, that's not a news story that you see uh, reported much on. It's usually, um, it's usually uh, seen as a huge victory, but a, a huge victory would have been a, a much broader articulation of the nature of that power. Um, how does that translate into other domains? Well, it takes away from the government the defense that they can't do certain things because the provinces have jurisdiction. So it, I think it, it, it does um, uh, make it easier to say that the federal government has the lead role. And in fact, that that role is a, is a legal duty. Um, I guess that would, be my, that would be my thought on the case at this point. It's something we can build on. Let's put it that way. Yes, I completely agree with Chris. It was not a surprise. There are many um, areas in which there is a shared jurisdiction between the province and the, and, the, and the federal. And of course, this has advantage and disadvantage. Uh, when there are provinces that can set up the bar higher at a higher level, it, 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 it is important. And actually in the, in the carbon tax, Quebec had already an experience with that for so many years before. And when the federal carbon tax appeared, it was like, okay, why we're we going back to that? It should have been more, it should have been better. Uh, but we had uh, differences with respect to other provinces. And, and, and the government, I, I thought that it was very smart to say, okay, uh, provinces will have flexibility in deciding whether it's a backstop or how they are going to approach the problem. So um, uh, I, yes, I think that the course could have been more clear and more, um, how can I say this, um, 
give more room to the government to do more, but it was not. But that's what it is. So we will have to live with that. All right. And I noticed that you have both been answering questions in the chat. So thank you. You're, you're being very effective. Um, one last question, and then I'll, I'll turn it back to, to Alex to, to wrap up the session. Um, this is for, for both of you. Uh, can the Senate bring in a bill to establish a commission on the well-being of future generations as they've done in Wales? Yes, we, we can. And we are, this is not normal times with the COVID. There are so many political games. I am new at this. I'm learning a lot. Uh, there is dilatory techniques, there are delaying techniques. There is a lot of push, pulls and push up to, to, um, to follow a, an agenda that is not that the government agenda. Uh, but for example, what I can tell you is that the, uh, one of our, my colleagues in the Senate put a, a, a bill um, on the reducing the age for voting. So to 16. And, uh, and that's a way of, you know, hearing more from young generations. And also the other thing that we are doing is that as senators, our offices, we are building up a youth council that comes and tell us what, what, what is happening. And, and yes, I think that that question is more important than the one that is being put forward in the Senate right now, which is what is the future of the oil industry in Canada? There is a lot of push up for answering to this question in a moment with the, when um, the International Energy Agency, which is composed by uh, nations that produce and export petroleum said, said there is no room for new projects. So we are seeing this contradiction. Some people says it's because this industry is dying. And so it's doing whatever it can to, uh, to survive. But I think the question on the future for uh, what is the future for the next generation of Canadians is right far more important than than the other one. And would you like to add to that at all, Chris? Only to say that was very well said and that I'm very happy that Senator Galvez is in our upper chamber. Great. Well, with that, I, I really want to thank you for for sharing your time. I think you've done an amazing job to to really set the the tone for the conference, and I'm, I'm I'm sure a lot of the concepts and the ideas that you've discussed will will continue to resonate um, with the participants as as we start to um, move into additional sessions of the conference.